Maybe you've seen it by now, a monkey with a Neuralink implant playing Pong with his mind. While this video is astounding enough on its own merits, what it portends for our future is even more mind-boggling. Let's consider just a couple of positives. No more learning foreign languages and no more passwords. And also, let's think about a nasty problem in the future. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So this is a rather speculative episode here. I'm not talking about anything that's going to happen next week or next year, or probably not in five years, but you know, like a decade or more into the future. So I'm just kind of, you know, thinking about the future here. So don't expect me to be saying like, oh, by next week, they're gonna have these things done. But what Neuralink is working towards and what things they've shown us at this point indicate that the future could be really, really different than what we have today. So first of all, let's take a quick look at the video itself. I'm just gonna show a couple of little slices of the video. If you wanna see the entire original thing, definitely check the link in the description. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone, just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. The links record from more than 2,000 electrodes implanted in the regions of Page's motor cortex that coordinate hand and arm movements. By recording from many neurons and feeding their activity into a decoder algorithm, we are able to predict Page's intended hand movements. First, we calibrate the decoder. As he's playing this game, we are wirelessly streaming, in real time, the firing rates from thousands of neurons to a computer. Using these data, we calibrate the decoder by mathematically modeling the relationship between patterns of neural activity and the different joystick movements they produce. After only a few minutes of calibration, we can use the output from the decoder to move the cursor instead of the joystick. Pages still moves the joystick out of habit, but as you can see, it's unplugged. He's controlling the cursor entirely with decoded neural activity. Our goal is to enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind pong. He's focused, and he's playing entirely of his own volition. The reason Neuralink works is because it's recording and decoding electrical signals from the brain. All right, so the upshot here is that the monkey, only six weeks after having the implant, and after only a few minutes or hours of calibration, the monkey is able to play Pong with its mind as if it was using his right hand, you know, right? <laughs> so essentially he was moving the joystick around at the beginning, but then they disconnected it, and then essentially at the end, it looked like he wasn't even using his right hand at all. He was just imagining using his right hand to, to, to move the paddle around. Now, obviously Pong is a simple game. It only involves moving the paddle up and down in the y-axis, whatever. But still, this shows amazing potential for the future. And in the near term, obviously, what Neuralink is really going for is helping people with debilitating diseases like paralysis or potentially MS or other things like that, or even missing limbs, be able to control parts of their body or uh, alternatively robotic parts or something like that with their minds. And that is simply astounding stuff. But what I want to do here is cast our minds a little bit further into the future. So the first thing is foreign languages. So what we've got now, if you've ever used Google Translate, I mean, <laughs> all right, if you used a translation service, an automated one, let's say in 2005 or something, it was laughable. It was a ridiculous exercise in gibberish. It just <laughs> Whatever it was, it was not reproducing your own language. So if you were translating from Chinese or something into English, it would just be gobbledygook. Uh, it, was, it was initially better with languages that shared some common traits, things like Romance languages, like Spanish and French and English, and to some extent German, because there's a lot of similarities between the way those languages work. But certainly taking something like Hindi or, or Mandarin or Korean or something that's a very, very different type of language and melding those things together, just didn't work. 
the, what's happened in the meantime is that Google in particular has created a deep neural network system that essentially creates its own language internally. So what it does is it takes, let's say, Mandarin Chinese, it translates that into its own internal language that researchers really don't even understand exactly what that is at this point, and then it takes it from that language and translates it to English. So we get Chinese to English, but internally what's going on is a black box, which is effectively kind of a, another language or a, a meta language, in fact, something like that, because what it does is it has descriptors which effectively tie language into ideas and it's able to translate it that way. I'm certainly no expert in this area, but I would be happy to do a video on that if people are interested how Google Translate actually works because it is utterly fascinating. And here's, of course, where we get into the future. So we have Neuralink. We have a future version, Neuralink 3.0 or something like that. And we have the ability to put chips in our minds. And as Elon Musk has talked about, and as many other people, futurists in particular, have talked about, the biggest problem we have is our interface with our computers. We have a very, very slow interface, right? We have our thumbs. <laughs> we have our thumbs. Our voices are faster, but our voices are still only on the order, you know, of 100 words a minute or so or something along those lines. Unless you're me, in which case it's probably a lot faster than that. But anyway, it's very, very slow getting data into the computer, and then it's pretty slow getting it back to us because, of course, we have to scan it, either reading it or listening to audio or something like that. So that is really, really slow. If you look at how fast computers can talk to each other, for example, your internet connection, which is able to download entire web pages and movies and things like that at very, very high speeds. What if we are able to plug into that massively, massively higher throughput speed, right? The IO to the human being is no longer the bottleneck. Well, that's one of the goals of Neuralink. So, right, if we can get these little probes, and, and part of the deal with Neuralink is it's not just the AI and everything, it's also the incredible types of precision surgery and precision uh, working with chips and with probes and sensors and things like that. It's really incredible stuff. But, okay, so let's just assume that they get that done and they can plug it into our language sensors what we can do is we could either by saying it or just thinking it, we could say like the cow jumped over the moon or something like right? that in English. And someone is standing across from us who is a Chinese person. They will auditorily hear the words, the cow jumped over the moon, but they don't understand what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a stupid sentence anyway, right? But anyway, what would happen is their neural implants would immediately kick in and say like, aha, that's English. I've identified it as English. Maybe it's connected to something like via Bluetooth, like with a pager that, you know, it's got a phone attached the phone then is connected to the internet. The internet is then able to very rapidly send back a translation into Mandarin Chinese, which I'm sorry, I don't know what that would be, but if anybody wants to put it in the comments, the cow jumped over the moon in Mandarin. Uh, anyway, so it would translate that and it would then pipe it into this person's head. Preferably, if it can do it at high enough speed, it would almost happen fast enough that it would be like, I would be talking and you'd get like an overlay. So I don't know if you've ever seen like UN translators where the people will be listening with their headphones and you'll hear the translators, they're so good at this. The, the person will be giving a speech in one language and they're basically almost in real time translating the speech into the other languages. So that's what would be happening, but it would be happening automatically. Now, is it going to be an absolutely perfect translation? Of course not. But if it's as good as what I see currently with text to text translations, if it can do that, from audio to audio, then we can carry on conversations with people who speak foreign languages. And that's why I'm saying we basically will discard the need to learn foreign languages because we will you know, you'll have your native language and it will have a such rapid, easy translation from you to anyone else in the world that it won't really matter. You'll just have a very sort of lubricated path. So we'll be taking the opposite of the, the Tower of Babel. So hopefully that biblical story is not true because I think God smote, uh, that's why he created the, they were building the Tower of Babel and I think God was pissed off at everybody for cooperating and <laughs> building a tower up to heaven. So caused everyone to speak different languages. So anyway, hopefully that will not happen. But I think that's an amazing outcome of the potential for Neuralink. And the second thing I want to talk about is no more passwords. If you've seen my video on how much I hate passwords, and if you haven't, you should definitely look at it. I detest passwords. I think they're one of the worst things ever created by man, and we need to demolish those. So what I'm thinking is, if we have this kind of an interface, 
you know, maybe what you do is you imagine a painting or something, right? So the thing says like you, you walk up to your computer or you walk up to your ATM or something and it says, think of your favorite painting. And so you think of a Van Gogh, but it's maybe it's Starry Night, right? So that, that's it's my wife's favorite painting. So there you go. So she would think of Starry Night, but it's not just the way that she thinks of Starry Night because somebody else could come up and go like, aha, I know Starry Night is her favorite painting but it would be the particular neurons that would fire and the way that she remembers it would be imprinted and that would be a, a very secure thing. It would be her thought patterns. Or, you know, again, it could be something along the lines of what's a great memory or just say a few words to the ATM or to the computer and it knows, it's able to understand not just the linguistic aspects of it, but the mental imprint that the, the neurons that are firing in particular for you. So I am so looking forward to the day that we can just completely remove passwords entirely from the system. And if we can hopefully have this stuff encrypted so that we don't have to deal with the fact that somebody could steal these things from us, uh, then, you know, because hopefully what it would do, it, was, it, was a, it would hash it <laughs> internally, and then it would just send out a hash. And so the hash would be unreproducible, but it would create something that would be recognizable between machines. So anyway, those are two hugely positive outcomes. The negative outcome that I'm worried about has to do with addiction. So, <laughs> and Elon Musk talked about this in a video. I can't recall which one it was. It was probably with Joe Rogan because that seems like the stuff he gets into. But he was talking about how, <clears throat> I would, I, let's, <laughs> Let's just not put too fine a point on this again. I try to keep this as a family channel. But, you know, think of the best sex you've ever had. Uh, that thing could be better than that, and it could be on demand. So it'd be like a drug, right? Like cocaine. I've never taken cocaine, but I hear it's very much like sex. But anyway, that the, the triggering in your brain could be done so that you could have basically the best sexual encounter or moment, <laughs> let's put it that way, of your life at any moment. So you could just be like, aha, you either push a button or you think about it and it happens. The problem with that is that people are addicted to sex, people are addicted to cocaine, people are addicted to alcohol, people are addicted to things that make them feel good. And so I could see really big problems with this. I could see people, once they discover this, and if you implant it in the right place so that you can trigger this, they would never leave the house again. They would literally potentially die. And I know that there are rats and other mammals that people have experimented with that will starve to death to try to get yet another hit of cocaine or something. So I could see that being a really, really big negative. And then let's go one step further and think super dystopian. What if you have a government that wants to control people and they can they have these neural link implants and they put them in and they can either give you the worst pain you've ever had or the best pleasure you've ever had depending on whether you're being a good citizen or not instantaneously, right? So it's like you do something wrong, you jaywalk and it's like you have crippling pain all of a sudden. And then if you're thinking about rebelling against the government, they would actually probably give you like the best sexual experience in your life so that you would have that happening and it would completely debilitate uh, uh, the entire population. There would be no way for people to stand up to this because these things are inside your mind and there's no way to escape that at that point. So while I'm a fairly optimistic person, I also really love dystopic science fiction. And this is the kind of like 1984 on steroids scenario that, wow, <laughs> they would know what you're thinking potentially because they have the neural link implants if they're connected to the, uh, to the big government and they would be able to reward or punish you instantly and they would be able to take away your motivation to do anything. If you had the motivation to do something that they didn't want, like rebel against the government, they would either give you so much pleasure that you would never be able to stop or, you know, <laughs> do anything useful with your life again or so much pain that you would never be able to do anything useful in your life again. So it's very, very terrifying that something like that could happen. So anyway, the long and short of this is the positives are huge. The negatives could be even more massive. So data privacy, or in other words, biological data privacy, like <laughs> our right to have our own brains and to have control over our own brains is going to be an issue in the future. And what a crazy thing that is, but we better start thinking about it now because it's going to happen someday. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and thought-provoking. If you did, definitely like it so other people can find it because you know how the AI works for YouTube. And also be sure to subscribe for more of this. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons on Patreon. You all are wonderful. I really appreciate all of your support and help. Thank you so much.
And definitely check out our merch store, which has Don't Mess With Tesla, All Input Is Error, and a whole bunch of other t-shirts and mugs and tumblers, etc., etc. And all of those purchases help out the channel. Thank you. And finally, don't forget that we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping will help out the channel. In the meantime, please do feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is knows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.